<laughs> we got the dogs in the background too. Lovely. All right. Hi, this is Joey Baird. And Holly Baird. From the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. You're listening to Smart Talk. The Mike Novak Show starts in three, three two, two, one. Here we will explore true facts about the leaf mimic Katie did. Hello, this is Katie. Hello, Katie. This is Evolution calling. Oh, E, what's up? Long time. Well, I'm just calling for your 100 million year check-in. Cool. How is it going? Oh, awesome. No, it's it's good. Yeah, I mean, you probably noticed. <laughs> yeah. What, what should I have noticed? <laughs> You're joking, right? We look we look like leaves, dude. We look exactly like a leaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Why? Oh, man, I knew you were going to do that. You're judging us. You're judging. You're theoretical. Out here, things try to eat you. Like, actually eat you. And then you come along and you're like, natural selection is going to cure all your problems. And we were like, fine, let's try it. And then when we finally get the package, guess what? I'm going to say it. Your instructions sucked. And while you're throwing curveballs at us, yeah, we went with let's look like a leaf. And you know what? We're damn good at it. We got brown ones, green ones, ones with spots, ones with holes in them. Was that easy? No, that took 20 million years. Thank you. And I am happy to report that every animal that is looking for what we used to look like before can no longer find us. Well, it sounds like it's working out then. No. No, the monkeys figured it out. They're freaking smart. I mean, now they're just looking for leaves that move. Um, we're kind of screwed. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome at 877-711-5611. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. This hour is brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. And where'd that come from? This is uh, our introduction to the show. And uh, to a conversation that I've been looking forward to for a while, this is with our friend, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Uh, he's uh, the author of a brand new book, Nature's Best Hope. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Now, the thing you need to know, oh, yes, hold up the book, please. I'm, I he, think I'm lined up with the camera. There we are. The thing he is into is science. Okay, he's a science guy. Uh, he's also quite a writer. Um, and if you rec recognize the name, it's because, and he's staring at us on the Skype right now. I'm looking, <laughs> he's looming over us like, like a deity, all right? Uh, <laughs> we, we can't hear him, so. I'll tell you what, let's, let's bring him in. Uh, uh, Dr. Tallamy, good morning. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Uh, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm fine, but uh, no deity here. <laughs> <laughs> just no deity. There is just science. Okay, science. And right. exactly. Um, I can't wait to talk to you. That it scares me to death because there's so much in your book uh, that we're not going to get to all of it. So what I might just say is, why don't you just speak for 45 minutes and we'll uh, turn <laughs> we'll turn on your mic. <laughs> But, uh, no, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation uh, with uh, Doug Tallamy. Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. So, as I said on my blog, Nature's Best Hope is you. So you better listen. We'll be right back. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. And 95.9 FM. Well, 
welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. As I mentioned in our first segment, you should settle back, grab a cup of coffee. Don't wander too far mm-hmm. from your radio or Bring from the whole pot of coffee over. Yeah, you don't right. want to leave the radio. Please, Not at all. Please don't spill it into the keyboard. I've done that. <laughs> uh, you know what's even worse, Dr. Doug Tallamy? And I don't know if you've ever done this. Um, don't ever spill uh, a shot glass of brandy into your keyboard. Ooh. No, no, I haven't done that. No. Uh, that was it. I mean, you, you could practically. That was it. Boom, yeah, I done. know. You could practically <laughs> see the sparks coming off of it, and that that computer was done at that point. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Uh, but then, you know, I was at a major radio station and once spilled uh, almost an entire can of Coke into a control board. Um, that oh that was not good either. So. Um, Tomato juice. Try tomato juice. I've done that. <laughs> tomato juice? Oh, oh boy. Yes. You know, I should have brought some. I've got some sitting at home. I should have it here right with me now. Uh, Doug Tallamy is the author of uh, several books. I first met him in 2000. I think this is the fourth time we've chatted um, uh, yeah. over the years. Um, I know 2008, 2012, 2015. And I think now, so I think it's four, because um, the first time I talked to you, you just uh, had gotten your first, uh, was that your first book, Bringing Nature Home? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's what I thought. Um, uh, how Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens. And I've got the copy I had at the time, and it still has all the sticky tabs uh, <laughs> in, in the book from our first interview um, in 1927. So, <laughs> uh, and it makes me want to open it and say, what did I, what did I mark at that time? Yeah, what, what's changed in your perception since then? Uh, so, but what I remember of the book, well, let me just say this. Uh, I ran with your book and the ideas of it, and, and folks should know that you kind of become, and I know you, you don't like, you're not a deity, but you're kind of an icon in uh, the natural world because your ideas have really taken root. Um, and so congratulations on that. In fact, I go into garden talks now and I say, you need to get, you need to read this book. You need to understand how important insects are in our world. You need to understand um, how we're losing habitat at an alarming rate. Uh, and you need to do something about it. And that is what this next book, I mean, you wrote a book in between uh, with Rick Dark. Uh, who's going to be actually speaking at uh, Allen Centennial Garden. We just did a, a commercial for that um, uh, very, very soon in March. Uh, but that was uh, The Living Landscape uh, that you wrote with Rick Dark. And now you've written Nature's Best Hope, which is sort of a sequel to Bringing Nature Home. And let me just say, this one has even more sticky <laughs> sticky tabs in it. And you know you're in trouble when, yeah. you're, when you're trying to write a blog <laughs> A blog post, and you go back to figure, find the pages that you wanted to mention, and there are a hundred of them. So, uh, I would say congratulations because it tells me how much good information is in this book. And the thing that I'm very impressed about is you finished the job that you started, or or you've moved along the way. Because in bringing nature home, um, and I think you and I discussed it was a lot about what was going on in the East Coast because that's your frame of reference, and now you've expanded it to the country and the world uh, and what we should be doing. So with that as a prelude, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, uh, where, would you, uh, where would you like to start? I mean, there are, so, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are so many concepts in here that are important. Maybe we should start with lawns. Maybe, you know, uh, we Oops, should. Sorry. That's okay. It was the book. Uh, See, the, the, even the book was happy. It, it hit the dinger. Uh, yeah. I, I would say, what, let's start with what's a homegrown national park. Sure. That's a concept you bring up, and you did in uh, Bringing Nature Home. Well, yeah, what is the idea of a homegrown national park? Okay, well, that, that actually gets back to, to lawns. We have more than 40 million acres in lawn today, which is uh, bigger than the uh, size of New England, and we're still adding a lot of lawn each year. So uh, I remember one day sitting down saying, well, what would happen if we cut that area in half? <clears throat> that gives us 20 million acres to play with. And I started adding up the size of national parks in the lower 48. 
Uh, and it turns out that uh, you add up all of them or nearly all of them, and it's still less than 20 million acres. So here's an opportunity to create the largest national park in the country. Be a little bit different because it's gonna be scattered all over the place. But I call it homegrown national park because we're gonna do it at home. We're gonna do it at least on private property and managed landscapes. And it'll be, uh, it'll be a, a vital source of conservation because those are the areas that are in between our national, our real national parks, in between our parks and our preserves. Uh, and that's gonna provide connectivity so that they're no longer isolated fragments of habitat. So we're essentially gonna, we're gonna reduce the area in lawn, put the powerful plants back that, that support uh, the life around us. And that will provide the connectivity that allows both plants and animals to uh, survive in between those parks and preserves. You talk about uh, connectivity, uh, and that's a key to some of your writing. Uh, the <laughs> idea that you can try to have pockets, you can, you, you can have preserves, you can have wilderness areas, but if they're not connected to anything, it's harder for species to survive and thrive. Very, very much so, yeah. Um, you know, we, we've had the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. So humans are here and nature someplace else. So we, we keep um, driving our conservation efforts into more and more remote areas, the only places that don't have humans in them, mm -hmm. uh, which means those areas are small, they're isolated. The problem with conservation in small areas is that you're talking about small populations and small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction because all populations fluctuate. In good times they go up and bad times they go down. So just randomly, sometimes in their down cycle, they blink out of that little habitat that they're in and then they're gone. That's so you've just lost a species from, from that fragment. And you might think, well, why don't they just recolonize? Because that's where the, the isolation comes from. Where are they gonna recolonize from? Um, it's often a, a, a big distance. Just picture a box turtle crossing a major highway. It doesn't happen anymore. So the connectivity is vital so that you don't just deal with tiny populations. You're dealing with larger connected populations. So if one blinks out, it's connected to another one that can then uh, uh, repopulate that, that area. Uh, I'm interested in, in the argument, and as you talk about connectivity, the argument that y you have with certain people who claim that if we bring in non-native plant populations, it's okay because it's a, it's a world ecology now that we have. It's not just the local, and you're being, you're being too, I don't know, um, uh, Fussy. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, and, and you make a, a cogent argument against that. You, you, you actually do something important, which is uh, redefine your terms. You, you eschew the word alien for um, introduced, which I think is a very, very good idea, because every time you say an introduced plant, you know you're talking pretty much about humans, probably 99% of the time. It's humans, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. and unfortunately, I'd say a lot of the time, it's the the so-called green industry. Uh, yeah, eighty. What is it? Eighty-five percent, eighty-six percent of our invasive woody plants have come from our gardens. We brought them in on purpose. So, um, yeah, we're bringing these plants in. And if all plants were equal in their ecological roles, if they if they functioned equally, uh, then it, it really wouldn't matter. Our ecosystems would look different, but they would function just as well. So the question is, do, do non-native plants, do introduced plants function as well in this country uh, as the native plants that they're displacing? Uh, and all the evidence suggests that uh, no, they don't, particularly in their role of supporting food webs. So food webs are driven uh, by the energy in plants, but that energy has to be removed from the plant and then given to the animals that, that need it which means something has to eat the plant. And most animals don't eat plants directly, they eat something that ate the plant, and that something is typically insects. So this is the important uh, point here, is that most insects cannot eat most plants. We've got uh, host plant specialization. Most of the insects that eat plants can only eat, can only develop on a very few lineages of plants um, compared to all the opportunities that are, that are out there. And I always use the monarch butterfly as an example because people understand if you're going to have monarchs or you're not gonna have monarchs unless you have the milkweeds that support them. That is a typical host plant specialization there. They can eat all the milkweeds, but if it's not a milkweed, you're not gonna have, have monarchs. 
but that's true for uh, about 90% of the insects that are out there. You need the plant lineage in which they specialized on in order to have those insects. And I think that's uh, an important point that we need to drive home. Uh, I, as you're a scientist, you understand that. You've studied this. I think most people have an idea that an insect can land on any leaf. It's going to chow down on the leaf uh, and move on to something else. Um, I decided that you needed a subtitle, a different subtitle for your book. Uh, and my subtitle is, or why you need to stop planting hostas, burning bushes, calorie <laughs> pears, and butterfly bushes. Uh, <laughs> you need a longer title than that because <laughs> there's a lot of other things we need to stop. And well, this entire volume. Right, yes. exactly. <laughs> but uh, for instance, okay, let's talk about a peony. All right, it's not invasive. Uh, right. It's not gonna. It's not gonna take over your yard. It's beautiful. It doesn't have a whole lot of connection to the native insect population in your yard, does it? Um, it yeah, right. It doesn't. Uh, although it does have one connection. Um, peonies are famous for their interaction with ants. Yes. Mm -hmm. so ants like to go to extrafloral nectaries, these little glands on plants that that produce nectar, uh, and they will actually defend them. They're not very fussy about which ones they go to, which is why peonies uh, have had these glands and the ants occupied them. Um, so that is one connection, but, but, but peonies but, but, are flowers. They're, they're flowering. A lot of people say, well, I see pollinators come to these plants uh -huh. and you very mel well may see them, but just like the insects that eat plants, we've got specialists and generalist pollinators. Honeybee is a generalist. Most of our bumblebees are generalists. And when you see those bees go to your, your flowers, you say, well, I, you know, I'm doing well, even though this is an introduced plant. But we have to take care of the 4,000 species of native bees, many of which are specialized on particular plant genera. So for example, where I live, there are about 13 species that can only reproduce on the pollen of goldenrod. If I put peonies in my yard, I lose those 13 species because they don't have what they need. And that is true for asters, it's true for native willows, it's true for sunflowers. They all have a suite of specialist bees associated with them, and the peonies aren't, aren't meeting the needs of any of those species. Uh, so there is room for compromise here. I recently uh, had a, a student, Desiree Narango, who, who graduated uh, last year, but she worked with chickadees in, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and the bottom line is that she found when you have uh, 70%, at least 70% of the biomass of the plants in your yard native, you can have sustainable chickadee reproduction. Hmm. But when you exceed that, when there's more than 30% introduced plants, um, then the chickadee population declines steadily. Uh, so that gives us a target. There's actually room for compromise there because uh, the, you can have your crepe myrtle or your peony or your camellia. Um, as long as it's not more than 30% of the plant biomass in, in your yard. <laughs> good luck and, with and that. And to me, that, that's good news, because if I said you can't have any introduced plants, there wouldn't be many people listening to your show. So, <laughs> or, or you, unfortunately. Or me, right. <laughs> but, but, but my point would be, and we're going to break here in about a minute, uh, my point would be is that we've gone so far down the wrong road right now we're in a cul-de-sac mm -hmm. if you look at uh, peggy was talking about uh, driving in today and looking at the yards what'd you see peggy i saw a lot of um, dead grass and burning bushes and privets and little clumps of yews and evergreens and that's about it yeah and big and big isolated trees and in the and in the urban areas boxwoods we love our boxwoods in yeah. the urban areas but just nobody's yard at least the front yard, looking like it was accommodating any sort of nature. And most that's of the time. what passes for landscaping in America. Um, I started a group called the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance back in 2002. It survived for 15 years, but at that time we were saying there's got to be a better way, and it, we had a hard time surviving. Okay, so we'll get we'll get to that sort of thing in a second. That is Dr. Doug Tallamy. He's the author of Nature's Best Hope. Uh, we hope you pick up a copy today. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we'll be right back. Hey, it's 
Okay, so our mics are still open on Facebook. We've got, we have a few questions here. Oh, good. Let's get some in. Now we're on the air. Oh, no, no, no. Well, let me. From Audrey on. So Audrey wants, to, Audrey says, what do you think about the UN's 30 by 30 plan to preserve 30% of the planet by 2030 and 50% by 2050 to delay the sixth mass, hey, this is mass Farner, extinction. CEO of I had, okay, that's Quicken very interesting. Our best and then she ever. says... Do you want me to comment on that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, because our, our Facebook friends are still hearing us, so we can keep okay. this going. Um, yeah, that, that's, we're targeting uh, E.O. Wilson's Half Earth uh, idea. We have to preserve ecosystem function on half the Earth or we're going to lose it all. Or kitchen you've always wanted. The so yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a wonderful idea, great great APR plan. But to accomplish that, we're going to need a new uh, a new approach to conservation. And we've got to get rid of that. We're only going to conserve the areas where there are no humans. Uh, we've got to create functional ecosystems where there are humans because half the earth is already in agriculture. We're going to take it out of agriculture. So we've got to do all this preservation in the other half where we've got eight billion people. So. Um, and how do you do change it. that paradigm, though? Yeah, we, we, yeah, I, I fully support it, but we need to do it right where we've got a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. So she continued. She said we could start in Illinois with 30% of state, counties, parks, neighborhoods, businesses, homes, basically what you, you suggest in the book. But how do we get this moving, she asked. Well, that's what we're doing today. I mean, yeah. <laughs> education. Although you could turn it around overnight by changing the tax structure. If people got tax benefits yeah. by changing the way they landscape, they would be on board immediately. If they get rewards. Exactly. As you said, as, as a, carrots as opposed to sticks. Yeah, exactly. Our last best hope for saving uh, Let's see, we've got uh, somebody who says no more hostas. And it comes to Chicago. Um, very impressed. I wouldn't we'll say no more. I'd say limit the number of hostas. Well, Karen, this Karen, she says she's going to make even more changes in her yard this spring. Children as young as age three. Venues include Navy Pier, and let's see, West Cook Navy Wild Museum, Ones are, are cheering. Center and more. Be part of <laughs> You're going to be there speaking with them? Film Festival. Good. Go to yeah. winearthfilmfest.org. Can I, can I do a shout out to another talk? I'm, sure. I'm gonna, sure. I'm, it's going to be at the, uh, in Elgin. Do we want to do this when we're back on the air? Uh, yeah, let's do it. If you're going to be in Elgin, let's do it when we're back on air here. And we'll talk about the one for the West Cook Wild Ones as well. Yeah. Okay. You talk about that because I don't have that one, that information. I've got that information here, and it's on my uh, blog post. Okay. This is a big one. Then a coal company came. With the world's largest shutter, with a torch at the timber, and it stripped all the land. Then they dug for the coal, till the land was for sale, and then they wrote it all down as the progress of man. Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County, down by the Green River, where paradise lay? Well, I'm a sorry, my son. But you're too late to ask him. Mr. Peabody's cold train is a holiday way. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. And it seems to me, Dr. Doug Tallamy, that that's, <laughs> that's the song the, mm -hmm. uh, for your career is uh, what did we do here and, and how do we fix it? Uh, I was kind of surprised and, and amused when you mentioned Star Wars in your book. And I hope you're not getting a lot of blowback for that. Um, uh, not yet. Not <laughs> yet, uh, because you talk about all the planets, they're desert planets, or a, a, a city covers the entire planet, and you're saying, where's all the green stuff? You can't survive without plants. Um, mm. And it seems to me our, uh, you know, it's all dystopian, basically, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's permeated our culture that we are totally isolated from nature. Plants are decorations. They're nice if you have them, but it doesn't matter if you don't. Uh, and, you know, I don't know about the planets in, in Star Wars, but our planet <laughs> needs plants. Uh, all the energy comes from the sun. It's plants that capture that energy, turn it into food, uh, and then they distribute it. But they don't distribute it equally. So we need to focus on the plants that are really good at passing on that energy, or we're going to lose the, all the other organisms that run the ecosystems that support us. So we can, this can be an entirely selfish argument. We absolutely need highly functioning ecosystems for our own well-being. And that will also help a lot of other things. But um, we, you know, it's just not optional to look at ecosystem collapse. 
Yeah, and and I, I to recap here, folks, uh, in nature's best hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. The idea is, as you just mentioned, plants. We need plants because they convert the sun's energy uh, into food, into uh, nutrients that we can use. And basically, it's done through insects. So you need insects feeding on plants because then birds and mammals and other critters mm-hmm. on the planet, including humans, eat those things. And, it, and, and we get you, all the nutrients. And, and, yeah, and they all get passed along. The problem here is there's a roadblock. Uh, early on, if we're putting the wrong plants out there, or we've allowed non-native plants to be introduced into our ecosystems. Now those insects can't take that energy and pass it along up the chain. Uh, and that's causing a lot of problems. And one of the things you note, and we all know it because we've talked about it on this show many times, is the decline of worldwide biomass of insects. That's got to be alarming to you. It's very alarming. What's interesting is it, it's apparently alarming to other people too. When when the headline came out in the New York Times about global insect decline, insect apocalypse, I started getting emails from all over the country from concerned people. And that's good news to me because we are not going to solve this problem if we don't even recognize that it exists and if nobody cares. So that headline was followed by a, another one. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, just in North America. And, and you, the UN you, says we're going to lose a million species. None of those things yeah. are optional. We can't allow that to happen. But it, but they are happening. And I, 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 for, you're, you're a positive guy. Your book is a call, a clarion call, to get people to do the right thing. I'm, I'm not quite as positive as you are. I, <laughs> I look, I, you know, we can't even stop asphalting over parking lots. You know, we can't even be bothered to let water percolate back into our soil. What makes you think that people are going to give up on their lawns and put native plants there? We've got the city of Chicago fining people $600 for putting native plants in their front yard. What makes you think we can change that culture? Now, don't depress me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He's playing devil's advocate. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I have been talking about this for more than ten years, and all of the things you just mentioned are happening for sure, but less and less. I do see a change happening. Um, it's a positive cultural change. It's happening everywhere, even in Illinois. And even though we still have some diehards out there uh, fighting for the old, the old way, the logic is overwhelming. So I know we humans resist logic uh, a lot, but eventually we cave in and we say, this is this really is our, our only option for yeah. the future. So, uh, you know, the last last couple of talks I've, I've given, people are so interested in this. They, you know, they can't find venues big enough. Um, so people say, why, you know, why are you optimistic? And I just look at the audience. I'm optimistic because mm-hmm. you people are here tonight. You know, they're Everybody is interested in this, and that is what's going to make the change. Those are the people that vote for the 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 officials and our policies that you know are are strangling us at this point. So we vote, you know, we vote early and often, and we can actually change. This. And I'm only going to depress you one more time here, and that's <laughs> and just say that that's part of our problem too. Is you look at the top of the the political chain in this country, um, our our uh, natural protections and and laws are being dismantled brick by brick right now. Now, that can change in November, but people need to know that if you want to make if you want to just save the ecosystems of our country and and the world as well, you need to have that change because that guy is not going to be the one to move us in the right direction. That's all I'm, I'm just and, saying. You know, and I think it's some of the, the bringing it home. You know, if you, if you want your grandchildren to be eating 30 years from now, or like you brought up the story in the book of the the um, the monarchs and the, the milkweed of the person who had convinced her father um, who didn't want anything except he decided he liked monarch butterflies and started planting milkweed. That's a positive story. I did like that. I appreciate right. that. True, true story. You, you know, uh, we're relaxing policy right now, relaxing regulations, because um, that's what people say they want. But that's the way it used to be. That was That's the way it was when the Cuyahoga River caught on mm-hmm. fire. Yeah. Because there were no regulations on industry at all. And that's exactly where we'll go. 
but the pendulum will swing back. People will say, no, we don't want our, bird, our rivers burning. We don't want to lose all our, our birds. Also, we can pump out a few more uh, gallons of, of oil and gas. Make a little more money. So, yeah. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to swing back. Um, yeah. Be, be positive. Okay. I'm, so, I'm working hard at it. So one of our viewers, Candace, she's got a great idea. She says to send copies of your book to all your city's elected officials. There you go. I like that idea. That's a fantastic <laughs> idea. So, uh, and, or come out to see uh, Doug Tallamy speak. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, while we were in the break that you're going to be speaking in Elgin, uh, which is near Chicago. And uh, tell us about that a little bit, and then I'll mention another place that you're going to be speaking. Okay, it's at Northern Kane County Wild Ones event on April 4th uh, at the center at 10 a.m. Okay, and I've, but I've got uh, also the Naturally Beautiful Conference sponsored by West Cook Wild Ones and Unity Temple's Eco Justice Team on April 4th at 1 to 4.30. Are, they, are those two different events? They are two different events in two different places, and I'll be a busy boy. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Well, so if you're in the Chicago region, then you got two opportunities to hear Doug speak. And I heard him speak the last time he came out to West Cook Wild Ones. Uh, and uh, you're right. The place was packed. I'm telling you right now, I'm looking at uh, Facebook. We've got a ton of people who have tuned in to to watch you talk to us today. And a million questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love one of the concepts I love is carrying capacity. We've got about two minutes here. We'll start talking about this, but you talk about carrying capacity and I hadn't heard that concept before. And I love it because it helps explain why certain plants work in an ecosystem and others don't. Carrying capacity. It's an ecological term that describes um, how big a population can get in a particular area. Um, it can exceed the carrying capacity, but that will reduce the resources that support it, uh, which means the carrying capacity will be smaller after that. Uh, ideally, you, you uh, reach a point in which you can uh, go along and, and exist indefinitely at a particular population without degrading local, local resources. Um, so we have increased the carrying capacity for humans on planet Earth by finding a bunch of, of alternative energy supplies. Before, we used, just used to burn wood. Then we discovered oil. Then we had the green revolution. We could make a lot more food. But in doing so, we've taken a lot of resources that other creatures need. So every time we add more humans to the planet, we're decreasing all the other life forms. And the reason that's important is because it's the number of species in an ecosystem that determine how well that ecosystem functions and how, um, how stable it is. And every time we take species away, it is more unstable and, and produces fewer ecosystem services. And let's be clear here. We have too many people on this planet right now. Right when, now. when folks- we are, we are yeah. three times over the carrying capacity of this planet. We reached our capacity, in, as you said, in about 1974. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we've continued to exceed it. Uh, so anybody who tells you, don't worry, we can handle that many people on the planet, but the world cannot handle that many people. On we already are not handling it. So. Yeah. All right, we'll be right back with Dr. Doug Tallamy. Point nine FM. The no big river, the no the no That's for uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, and of course, that is uh, Randy Newman. Uh, burn on, big river, burn on. Uh, it, it, we, had, we had to mention the Cuyahoga River mm -hmm. and what happened to it, I believe, it was 1968 or 9 when it caught fire. But we, they tell us we're better off now, that things, things are better. Uh, you know, that, there's the Cuyahoga uh, National Park. It's the newest national park. So that's how much they've turned it around, just by some regulations. Okay. I thought the Lake, uh, the Indiana, Indiana Dunes, du Dunes was the, the newest national park. Okay, I'm out of date then. But it's <laughs> only a few years old. Yeah, It's no. the newest one in Ohio. All right. All right. Indiana Dunes became a national park, I believe, last year. Yeah. So, okay. uh, right. but, Which is great, though. It's, it's, it's good for this area. Uh, that is Dr. Doug Tallamy, author of Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. Uh, we've got a lot of people saying they're going to pick it up, and I think that's a great thing. You should do it. Buy a copy of it. Read it. 
It's going to tell. We talked a little bit about lawns during the break. Doug doesn't want to get rid of all lawns. Uh, I always my my phrase about lawns is when in doubt, rip it out and <laughs> uh, and put it in something better. Um, and we get to get to a phone call in just a second here. Uh, but one of the things is you talk about native plants and how important they are, but not all natives are alike. As you say in the book, there are certain keystone species that are more valuable than others. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, that's, that's one of the most important findings that uh, we've come across recently. Um, about 5% of our native plants are producing about 75% of the food that drives these food webs. And I'll just give you a, a, a quick uh, example. Oak trees, the most powerful plants that we have in this country. Um, so where I live, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 557 species of, of bird food. I can compare that to tulip trees, another good native plant, but they only support 21. Uh, so there's a huge difference, even among native plants. Things like yellowwood don't support anything. Mm. But uh, many of the, the important ornamental non-native plants that we, we focus on, like, uh, like crepe myrtle, like um, ginkgos, they don't support any. So 557 from an oak versus zero from a ginkgo, which would you choose if you're trying to support your local insect populations? And, and that in itself is a new idea. People say, I don't want to support insects. But you have to if you want birds and if you want the rest of wild, wildlife. Yeah, we have to, we have to get past that, uh, that, the fear we install in our children. And, we're, and actually, young children don't have the same fear of insects that, that adults do. And sometimes I will mention that at a talk. I say, well, where does that change? Do we teach that in high school? Do we teach it in college? And suddenly you're an adult and you got to kill every insect uh, in sight. That's nuts. Let's listen to the commercials, Mike. Yes, that's exactly oh, yeah. what we teach them. Yeah. I saw a spider, hire me and I'll come kill it for you. I'm, I'm the guy who's now, I take a sheet of paper, get the spider, I'll mo move it out of the room. Okay, I just don't, do, I don't want you right on the couch, move someplace else, dude, and I take it and move it outside. I can't even crush a spider anymore. I, I, I keep a plastic cup and a, a piece of cardboard right there. Although I will. So I can always run and get it. Spider removal kit. Yep. Yeah. I, I will, Escort them out the door. I will stomp a, a cockroach, though, but uh, that's different. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, let's go to the phone line because there's a person in the book who just called in now. And caller, would you identify yourself, please? Sure. Yes, it's Pam Carlson. Hi, Doug. <laughs> Hi, Pam. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I uh, just wanted to call in and uh, tell the listeners that. Um, everything Doug is talking about uh, totally, totally works. Um, I've done it to my backyard. I've been doing it for years and years, actually. Um, and I'm up to 115 bird species sighted. Um, so I'm in the hope camp because when people see our backyard, it really um, resonates with them emotionally. And uh, I think it, it really makes them think about, wow, maybe I can do this too. What, what's critical about Pam's yard is where she is. She's right next to O'Hare Airport. She's right next to Kennedy Expressway. There's no connectivity with her uh, yard in any other wild place. Yet by, by putting in the right plants and having a little water feature, she was able to bring in all of these birds to her. And it's a tenth of an acre, tiny little space. So Pam's yard shows we can do this in an urban environment. And we've had Pam on the show. Mm -hmm to talk about that. And Pam, I think we got to bring you back, bring you back. And the next thing I'm going to do is make a trip to yes, your yard. We need, to, we need a road trip. Yeah. Road trip over to Pam. Awesome. <laughs> backyard. <laughs> bring your binoculars. Yeah. You, you have the coffee ready. We'll have the binoculars. What, what species are you seeing right now, Pam? That's what I want to know. Uh, right now in the winter. So I do, I monitor the backyard um, two consecutive days in a row each week. And um, I do that. Uh, I plug it into the Cornell lab of ornithology site so mm -hmm. regularly in the winter we get huge huge flocks of um mixed finches mm -hmm. so like just last week i had over a hundred wow. <laughs> finches in the yard um you know and then your typical resident birds that are here you know uh downy woodpeckers and uh chickadees we do get chickadees because we're definitely in that 70 at least that mm -hmm. 70 percentile of native plants juncos um and then 
Lots of Junko. Yep, there's a whole bunch of them back there right now. Right, I mean, as we speak, there's like 40 finches back there. There's about 10 Junkos, um, downy woodpecker. Um, we get robins, too, mm -hmm. all throughout the winter. Um, and then sometimes some, um, you know, like tree sparrows and white crown sparrows, you know, some stragglers that just hang out here. All right. We so it's get your exciting. Woodcock. We have we have two minutes left, so I'm gonna have to let you go, Pam. But if Pam, if people want to get a hold, okay. if people want to get a hold of you, where do they go? Uh, they can email me. You can go ahead and. Um, I thought you uh, had I a website. You, my... do you, you don't have. I a... don't have a website. <laughs> did you get your Did you get a Facebook I don't page? Have a website. Did you get a Facebook? I, I'm on Facebook. Just Pam Carlson. Yep. With At, a K. Just with my a, name. Yeah, K A R L S O N. Yep. Yep, and um, I, I can give out my email, too, if you want. No, it's okay. Pam Carlson, go to Facebook. Okay. You'll find her information. We're going to get you a website, Pam. All right, thanks for calling in. Really appreciate it. Uh, Doug, we got to wrap it up here. One of the things I want to let people know is that at the end of the book, after you've written uh, uh, 200 pages explaining everything, you go back and explain it again. In, <laughs> in free repeated exposure. <laughs> yes, that's what I love about the book. Tell them, tell them, and tell them again. You say it over and over until it sinks in, and it's the frequently asked questions. And it's not like your usual FAQ where you give two sentences. You go into detail in the. And uh, I really love that part of the book. You could start with that part of the book and then go read the rest of the book. Uh, so congratulations on that. Anything that you wanted to mention? We got sixty minutes or <laughs> sixty minutes, sixty <laughs> seconds left. Uh, uh, yeah, I do want to. I want to mention one of the main points of the book is to convince people that that each and every one of you are an important part of the future of conservation. You know, whether you own a piece of the earth uh, or whether whether you're in a high rise in the middle of a city, you can volunteer uh, in any of the natural areas. But we all, you know, the the concept that stewardship only is is the responsibility of a few experts. That's that's gone. Everybody is now responsible for taking care of our, our planet and the life. On I'm going to have to leave it at that. Dr. Doug Tallamy, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Financial.com. Welcome to the second hour of the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. This hour is brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All Welcome back to the Mike Novak bacon. Show with Peggy Malecki. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> I can't do that. I was gonna... Wrong headphone jack yeah, there. Yeah, hold on, hold on. <laughs> He's got to reach to the other side. We're, we're having uh, crackling and buzzing and humming uh, issues. You can take that music out. That's okay. Uh, thank you. And, uh, wow, what a great interview. That mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we're because of us, because of him, yeah. Doug Tallamy. And I would add to that song, all we need is good food to eat. All, w all our food needs is good bugs to eat. That's right. And I don't think we can stress enough how important insects are. So, folks, if you have insect phobia. Get over it. Insect phobia, I guess. Yeah. Get over it. Move on. Try something else. Because the movie Ants is not real. With, or them. With, it's with, not real. Uh, without insects, there are no human beings. Yep. Uh, he quotes in the book, uh, E.O. Wilson writes that if all the insects on the planet disappeared today, we'd last about six months. End mm -hmm. of story. And we're already losing insects hand over fist. You should be terrified. Of this, I know Doug's the positive guy. I'm okay. Here's here's your reality <laughs> check, folks. All right, we're losing him, and it's because we have too many lawns, too much lawn. We we bring in all these uh, non-native plants. We uh, don't have wildlife corridors. And and Doug's going to give you thirty percent. You get to have thirty percent non-natives in your yard. End of story. We should make it a law. <laughs> I mean, if you can find people six hundred dollars for growing native plants in the front yard yard let's find him a thousand dollars for having, not growing for native having plants. fewer than 70 percent mm -hmm. natives yeah. in, the, in your yard well and it, it's we talk really briefly for those who didn't hear the first hour nature's best hope with with doug tallamy was just even driving make it an exercise as you drive down the street take a look at everyone's lawns yep 
take a, and look at what they have in their yard. Even if you can't identify the shrubs, you'll see that they're the same shrubs. It's going to be a few yews. It's going to be some boxwoods. It's going to be burning bush. And people go, oh, but I love my burning bush. Guess what? Your ecosystem doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you except turn red mm-hmm. in the fall. Otherwise, it just sits there like a lump. So uh, just saying. I'm, I'm going to go into mean mode here. Okay? And by the way, if you go to my blog my, uh, at MikeNovak.net, M-I-K-E-N-O-W-A-K.net, and you read about Doug's book, uh, I write about his assistant, Kimberly Shropshire, his research assistant who developed the Native Plant Finder for the National Wildlife Federation. You can type in your zip code, your zip code, and find a list of native plants that are best for your zip code. That's how specific you can get. Uh, the problem is, uh, I just picked up the phone and called Doug because mm-hmm. Peggy and I were unable to get on that site. They're revising it. And I hope it's because so many people are buying the yeah. book and logging in. But they're, 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 it'll be up within the next few days. Yep. Um, but that's what I'm going to do. And, and it seems to me nurseries should do that. They should have 60647, here's your plants. 60657, here's your plants. Mm-hmm. They're probably m- mostly the same. But wouldn't that be a... Yes. A, instead of wa- well, walking We, we in were even talking over the break. Where do you get native willows? I don't know. Well, and, and you mentioned, what about Possibility Place mm-hmm. in Moni? And I would say, yeah. They, you know, they would sell you native willows. And they're not all 80 feet tall. There are understory w- willows as well. So... Yeah, so uh, this is the w- th- this is the how things have to change. You and, and and it's been hard because you go into a, a garden center and they're uh, organizing plants by color, and not necessarily, you know. Sometimes they even have natives and mm-hmm. non-natives. And are those native ours or, or true natives? Exactly. And are they native to Tennessee, or are they native to Wisconsin or to Illinois? We need we need to get more specific, folks. Okay. To be continued. To be continued. However, we're talking color next. Orchids at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It's the Mike Novak Show. Show in Chicago. Hey! Ha! da 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 ya! Ha! Hey! Cardi on scale of buco. What's the rumpus? Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Did they catch that? Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. That's a, a group called Gaelic Storm. This is from my old Sheffield Garden Walk CD wow. from 2013. So uh, cool. Maybe, maybe I'll play some a lot more of, fun. of those. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Hey, uh, you, you want to give a shout out to uh, some of our new sponsors this week? No. Let's move on. Okay. Yes, of course I do. <laughs> All right. Who have we got, Peggy? So Sitka Salmon Shares. You just heard the spot for that from... Uh, from boat to doorstep, if you use the discount code Mike25, you'll get $25 off your salmon shares. And I'm just going to tell you, because I do have a share, it's the best salmon, the best fish you've ever tasted in your life. And as we had we had Nick Mink on the show several weeks ago, who's the CEO and mm-hmm. founder, um, and he explains uh, about how they catch fish responsibly. And that's part of the whole deal. Mm-hmm. So uh, 25 bucks off if you yep. use the code Mike25. And then you also heard the One Earth Film Festival. The Power of We is the theme this year. It's running March 6th through 15th at locations throughout the greater Chicago area. You can go to oneearthfilmfest.org for all the details. And, and we'll be interviewing one of the directors, maybe two of the directors from the, yeah. the Film Fest coming up. And one more. One more. It is spring when you know that the Chicago Flower and Garden Show is coming back. 2020 Focus on Flowers, chicagoflower.com. March 18th through 22nd at Navy Pier. We're going to have Tony on the show in a couple of weeks. Tony Abruscato, who, mm-hmm. who is the uh, the director of the show. And it sounds like they've got some really, really cool stuff. Yeah, and we'll be giving away tickets for that in upcoming weeks as well. So there you go. You got it all. And speaking of great shows, uh, if you uh, are tired of the dreariness of winter in uh, Chicago... What you need to do is go on up to Glencoe to the Chicago Botanic Garden for their orchid show. It started just yesterday and continues through March 22nd. We have on the line with us right now on the, uh, is it the Zoom or the Skype machine here? 
the Zoom machine. He's zooming on yeah. in. Okay. Jim Hall, Ph.D., Director of Ornamental Plant Research at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and he also happens to be an orchid geek, right? Totally. I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> You Thanks know, for having me on. <laughs> oh my, our pleasure. You know, there's everybody's got their their love. You know, there are the daylily people, there are the iris people, there are the the scary ones are the carnivorous plant people. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and here I am. I, I work with plants professionally, and that's what I go to home to as a hobby too. So I ah. guess I'm 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 fully geeked into it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's that's. That's interesting that, yeah, you take your hobby home with you, and a lot of people don't. They always say that uh, the cobbler's children have no shoes, but you've got orchids all over your house, right? Um, well, I, I used to have them all over the house, jammed in every window and under lights, but about four years ago, I built a greenhouse at home, so it's, ah. it's full of orchids, <laughs> probably four to 500 at home. Uh, it must be and wonderful it, when you walk in there, too. Oh, fragrance especially. Yeah. That's really important to me is to get... Uh, you know, we were uh, joking a little while ago. It's a shame we don't have smell o vision here because I have some wonderfully fragrant orchids mm -hmm. here in the office with me that maybe I'll have a chance to show a few off. So, Well, why don't you tell us which are the fragrant ones if people are out looking for orchids? And, and let's, uh, let's face it, a lot of people love orchids, but I think a lot of people are terrified of them because they don't. You know, I always get questions from people w who have bought an orchid. And it stopped blooming, and they go, "Is this ever going to bloom again?" And um, <laughs> uh, I, I, how do you answer that question with people? Absolutely, yes. Well, <laughs> okay. uh, one thing I, I I tell folks is uh, that orchids really do best with a little bit of benign neglect, because probably uh, a lot are killed by over coddling, uh, too much water, too much light, for instance. Uh, so it's a matter of understanding their basic cultural needs, and and then making sure you don't overdo it. And so for instance, this time of year, especially with all this cloudy weather we've had this winter, I'm not watering plants even in my greenhouse more than about once a week. And so I have to be careful not to overwater, mm -hmm. otherwise I can cause disease issues, the roots to rot off. They're really kind of sleeping right now. Uh, and, and can I say that in my house, which is obviously much darker than what you have, I might go a couple weeks, I might go three weeks, and they don't seem to suffer at all. It depends on the plant, of course, yeah, absolutely. But, but I would rather err on the side of too much dryness than over water because you can't really correct over watering, can you? Uh, yeah, once you've killed the roots, then mm -hmm. uh, that's a bad cycle into the compost pile without a doubt. And the plant will tell you if it's getting too dry because the leaves will start to shrivel, the pseudobulbs will, will start to shrivel sure. a little bit, and you can realize it, kick it up. I tell folks, just basically once you see growth initiating at this time of year, whether it's roots, new leaves, flower stalks coming up, that's the time to start increasing the water. I, I just noticed that the other day. I'm sorry. I keep jumping in in front of Peggy here, and then I'll let you have no, a question. Okay. Uh, uh, my, <laughs> my, my beautiful, I uh, see, I have an avocado plant that's seven feet tall. Oh and I and I carried it from outside up two flights of stairs, no, a flight of stairs, and then a shorter flight of stairs. And in the, it's now in the upstairs room. And I noticed just this week it's starting to send out oh, yeah. uh, new leaves. My, my avocados, too. I mean, mine are not seven feet tall. They're about two <laughs> feet. But, yeah, they're all getting new little leaves. I've got several plants with new little leaves on uh, other house plants as well. And people say, are, are you going to get avocados? And I say, no, I don't have a greenhouse. That is not going to happen. If you can get it 15, 20 feet tall in your in your house, you might. You might. <laughs> hey. Not that big before they'll start making fruit. My, really? Okay. Or my lemon tree. The one lemon that's been on there since last June is finally turning yellow. I mean, it's a long cycle. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, what I was going to ask you on orchids for the home grower, um, and I might be jumping ahead, but I, I've never had luck with them. Sure. Uh, do you have them in plastic pots, clay pots? Do you have them in the in those um, uh, cedar baskets? What's the best uh, way for a home gardener? Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Uh, I prefer clay pots at uh, my home uh, for a couple reasons. One, just the weight factor, because sometimes orchids can get top heavy, and plastic pots. I I can't tell you how many times I tip them over, and then all the bark falls out of the pot, and then you have a mess to clean up, and you have to repot. Uh, also, because clay pots, of course, uh, they have that good porosity, a good aeration through the roots. And, and so many of the orchids that we cultivate are are from the tropics. They're epiphytes, which means they, they grow on trees. And so the roots are used to being uh, well exposed to air circulation, et cetera. So clay pot just gives you that. 
That said, uh, I do have other orchids that I grow strictly in um, plastic pots. The, the lady slipper orchids, for instance, the papiopetalums, which are very popular plants, um, because where those are native to, they're either growing in ground or where they do grow up on cliff faces, it's constant rain okay. in Southeast China or Vietnam. And so uh, keeping a little more moisture around their roots, a plastic pot makes more sense. So again, once again, you've got to know your plant. And you really do. Yeah, um, but it, it sounds like often, again, g uh, getting roots in too much muck, too much soil is is is, is almost detrimental. Yeah, it's it's not <laughs> good, absolutely it's yes, not good for and, the plants. And both those that grow orchids tend to repot. Uh, the lady slippers, for instance, because you're watering those heavily, I'll repot those every year, and I'll be coming up on that. Typically, March is when I like to start repotting because that's when the plants are are really waking up and getting active growth, uh, but it's before it gets unduly warm. And so the plants aren't stressed when you repot them at that time. Um, two years would be kind of the tops that I'll go between repotting. Mm -hmm. And if I go that long, it means I'm growing them more in a, in a gravel or a rock mix than a bark face mix. Talk about the, the kinds of mixes that uh, you should use. And I think that might be an area where people go wrong uh, out of the gate. Absolutely, yes. Um, the Still, the most common are, are bark face mixes, and this is literally uh, Douglas fir bark that was simply a byproduct uh, from the, the timber industry in the Pacific Northwest, and somebody realized 30, 40 years ago, hey, we can grind that into smaller pieces and grow orchids in it, and then there's a, a, a bark that's coming out of New Zealand now that's also a, a pine bark, but it's a bark that doesn't break down as fast, and so a lot of people are going to that. Um, Sometimes it's just straight sphagnum moss, and that's actually also coming from New Zealand. It's a higher quality sphagnum moss than is harvested here in this country. And so you'll see, for instance, the the, uh, uh, the moth orchids often are sold in sphagnum moss, and they grow very well in that. And, and then people just have their own mixes where they'll mix bark with perlite for extra aeration. Uh, sometimes charcoal is added, uh, small pieces, not not the cooking charcoal, but especially hardwood charcoal. But I would say bark is still probably the most common, followed by sphagnum moss at this point. Really? Now, I'm interested in the sphagnum moss because doesn't it have a tendency to make water run off? I mean, it's harder for it to be absorbed into the sphagnum moss, isn't it? Yeah. If you let it go bone dry, then it's, it's like a sponge that you've left in the kitchen haven't used for a month and then you go to re-wet it yeah. and you realize it's not absorbing water <laughs> and so you have to kind of work hard to get sphagnum moss uh re-moistened but that's typically used with orchids like the moth orchids and again the lady slippers that really want constant moisture mm -hmm. and so the rule of thumb is there you put your finger in the moss if you can still feel moisture you don't water and if it's getting dry then it's time to water it and i will say we tell people all the time and you know this uh Dr. Alt, that uh, folks really, if they have potted plants, they really shouldn't dig up soil in their yard and put their plants in them indoors. They, no. should, they should get a soilless <laughs> mix or at the very least, I, I'll tell you what I do occasionally. I will steal some compost out of my compost bin and mix it in with a soilless mix. Okay. I've done the same thing. Yeah, yeah just to add. Fair game. Yeah, yeah I, I was just mentally picturing you trying to carry your seven foot avocado up all those flights of stairs <laughs> in soil out of the garden and it's weighing 50 pounds. So oh. let's, let's not go there, folks. Yeah, there's, there's a YouTube video for that. <laughs> I, I repotted it a couple of years ago because it was in a terracotta. Uh, and I said, okay, enough of that. No. I'm going to hurt myself. So I put yeah. it in plastic, and actually it, it's good because it retains water better. And the avocado wants a lot of water. Uh, what as I have found, so it still drains well, but uh, now I can at least move it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's a, a lesson to folks. Uh, all of these mixes are readily available in garden centers, uh, sometimes even box stores. Yeah, even box stores will have them. And uh, but you know, mm -hmm. I always tell people to shop at your local independent garden center because Absolutely. because not only are you going to get the mix you want, they're going to explain to you how to use it. So. Uh, that that's not happening at the box store. So, and that that yeah. exact you're exactly right. And that's crucial. Yeah. And I would add that uh, absolutely all the independent garden centers in the Chicago area, uh, even if they're not selling orchids, they'll have somebody on staff with that expertise, and and they'll have the bark and the perlite. Um, there's some orchid nurseries still in the area. Hausman's, of course, uh, 
in the southwest suburbs is a venerable second, third generation. Uh, you can get your potting mix there. And uh, here during the orchid show, actually on the weekends, a couple of the local growers are, are selling bark mixes, mm -hmm. as well as the Illinois Orchid Society that's here uh, every weekend through the entire show uh, to basically, uh, there's a potting, repotting station and uh, to walk people through the very kind of questions that we're uh, talking about right now, just when to repot, how to repot, what size pot to use, what mix. And so folks can come up to the garden uh, any of the next five weekends and buy uh, bark here as well. And buy orchids on the well, weekends. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There is that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then on March 14th and 15th is the actual Illinois Orchid Society spring show. And Correct. So. And and that, of, of course, I'll, I'll tell folks who are really uh, more in the depth of orchids or want to see a lot of diversity, the, the gardens displays are just phenomenally artistically done. And, you know, we, we talk about 10,000. Uh, flower buds, and I believe we're probably there. It's, At it's least, really amazing yeah. having walked through it the last two nights. But the Illinois Orchid Society is where all the, well, where the people like Mike and myself bring plants out of our collections. <laughs> and that's a juried show. So it, it's, uh, there will be three really large exhibits, the Illinois Orchid Society, Wisconsin, Iowa Orchid Societies will, will come over as well. And, and probably about 15 exhibits total with, I, I would imagine, over a thousand plants in totality. Mm -hmm. I can I can assure you I'm not bringing my avocado plant anywhere. <laughs> uh, it doesn't uh, fit in the car nicely. Well, not only does it not fit in the car, but because I don't have a greenhouse, when I bring it in for the winter, it gets beat up pretty good. You know, by the end of the winter, leaves have started to turn brown. Some of them are frayed, uh, and I'm I'm always very grateful when the new growth comes out because then I can pinch it back and get growth lower on the branches but some Absolutely. of the, so, yeah. so all those leaves will be a beanstalk otherwise yeah i know yeah. it's it's pretty beat up right now all right that is uh uh jim alt phd from the chicago botanic garden i tell you if you got a question you can call us 877-711-5611 we're going to talk more about orchids when we come back it's the mike novak show with peggy malecki geo am and fm Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're very pleased to be talking to the Greenhouse Growers 2019 Industry Achievement Award winner. Give that man a, 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 a ding. You get you get a double you get a beer ding as well. I've been found out. <laughs> uh, ooh, Jim Alt, PhD, Director of Ornamental Plant Research at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Tell us a little bit about the award before we get back into orchids here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, my primary responsibility here is as a plant breeder, and so I've been breeding uh, perennials for garden use uh, really since I started here in 1995. Uh, and I also run our plant production program, which are all of our plants that we develop, as well as a collaboration with the Martin Arboretum and Lyle. So basically kind of one-stop shopping. We develop perennials, they develop trees and shrubs. Uh, we don't sell plants directly. We, we license nurseries around the Chicago area in the country. So I got that award uh, based on my breeding efforts. I think I've got 35 introductions that have reached the marketplace now, and there were some interesting and novel ones along the way. I actually had the first orange coneflower into the marketplace was my very first introduction, which was a wild ride. We had no idea the firestorm that that was going to set it off. Uh, interesting. I don't breathe those oil anymore because yeah. I can't compete with the large nurseries, of course. And you're working with a, a lot with Baptisia too, right? That's correct. Yeah, we've had 12 of those and I'm, I'm back to breeding on them actually after a little pause. T tell me a little, just a little bit about the firestorm. I think I know what you're talking about because I remember when the mm -hmm. orange coneflower came out, um, and I I was on the fence about it to tell you the truth. <laughs> but and I and I imagine that's the kind of reaction you got. Absolutely yes, and and I I was looking at the old taxonomy literature, and echinaceas do naturally hybridize a different species sometimes in the wild down in the Ozark Mountains. And so I had picked up kind of some evidence that I, I thought there would be potential to make uh, really nice orange and yellow ones based on the different species being combined. And so I started on that my first year here. And it, and it takes a time to develop even a perennial yeah. uh, from that first cross on that to when we actually had that first plant 
in the trade, I think it was seven or eight years and typically even 10 years for flocks and other things I worked on. I was one year ahead of the competition. I wasn't the only person who had a green light go off on that and think about it. And, uh, you know, we, we had propagated, we had them with some big nurseries, Monrovia and some other big nurseries, but we had no idea the demand because uh, everybody's getting sold out. And, and I was actually getting, you know, ang distraught and angry people directly approaching me at the botanic garden. It's like, well, I, wow. I'm just, the, I, I'm the breeder. I'm not the grower. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're a challenge. And, and the orange cone flowers were very difficult to cultivate, uh, especially in the early years and the earlier derivations of them. But there was a reason that one of the two species, Echinacea paradoxa, is native to those Ark Mountains on limestone and very porous limestone. So you have uh, a plant with a tap root, high pH, no nutrients. The water just goes straight past the roots like that. And we drop them into our clay soils around here. We put mulch on, we fertilize. We get the hose out. We, we've just like we were talking orchids earlier. We probably killed with kindness an awful lot of the <laughs> orange cone flowers early on. So. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's I like that story. See, that's that's interesting, and I'm betting you didn't get rich off of this, um, <laughs> because I, I I know somebody who did get off a plant, and that's William Radler. You know who I'm talking? Oh, about? sure, Bill. Absolutely. Yeah. Knockout roses. The knockout rose, and I asked him. Uh, this is years ago because I asked him off air. I said, Bill are you rich? And he said, you're not going to ask me that on the air, are you? I said, no, no, I'm not going <laughs> and, and so I, 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 I've known Bill, so hopefully, uh, you, you know, I won't get in trouble for this, but at the, when the first royalty check rolled in for the first year of sales on that, he was able to quit his day job. Oh so. my goodness. I'll bet. Yeah. Cause, cause when I asked him off air, I said, are you rich? He said, yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> that's the way that went. But yeah. Uh, not, that, uh, not every really I, the, the 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 best example of a backyard breeder making it big time. He, exactly, he did. there's you, no question about you it. Gotta, Why not? You got to cheer him on because nobody makes money in horticulture. So if somebody did. How cool is that? It's yeah, awesome. He, he gets a ding. All right, <laughs> we want to give away a couple of pairs of tickets to the orchid show, and the way we're going to do that is you have to have been paying attention to this show so far. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, really, uh, Jim Alt talked about a couple of kinds of media that you can grow your orchids in now the first person to do it on facebook will get and you got to be able to go to the show don't make us give you the tickets if you're not going to go to the show <laughs> be, be sure you're going to the show uh the first person on facebook who puts it up there and then the first person who calls in at 877-711-5611 each way i i would say i can't you know once it's in print on facebook you know it's all Katie bar the door. So do it fast. 877-711-5611 or the first answer on Facebook. Yep. If you if you want two tickets and um, just. And, and uh, either uh, Hannah or Akilah will get all your information so that we can send the tickets to you. Right. You need to tell us what are, what's a good medium for growing your orchids. All right. Let's get back. You were going to do a little show and tell there. Absolutely. Uh, Jim. And I can tie in some of the questions we had earlier. So let me. Uh, reach behind me. You got to be watching this on Facebook, folks. So uh, look at this. He's look at that orchid. So let's see if I can hold the flowers down. Uh, we'll start with with the moth orchids. The scientific name on this is Phalaenopsis, but I think this is a great one to start with because first off, I think practically every grocery store and uh, uh, Home Depots, etc., are all selling these Phalaenopsis orchids now, and wonderful selections that are available. And, uh, and then I want to bring it up so you can see the foliage as well. And it's actually growing in ah, one of those media that we discussed <laughs> that be unnamed for a few seconds at least. And so uh, this one grows very well in the moisture retentive medium of which we discussed. You are and so, so good. You are so perfect, good. Yep. It's a perfect starter ah. orchid because this really handles low light. It likes the temperatures typically in the house. Uh, they bloom for a long time. These flowers will last upwards of a couple of months. And you can see we have additional flower buds here that haven't opened yet. Now, yeah. there's a little trick with these orchids. Okay. Mm -hmm. When all the flower buds fall off, if this flower stem is still green, do not cut it off because it will sit for maybe six, nine months, and then it'll start growing again, and it'll make another entire wave of flowers. I'm glad you said that because that's what one of my questions for our listeners who've never grown orchids is how do you know it's going to flower again uh you know, you know and how do you know when to give up on it but i imagine if it even has growing leaves you shouldn't give up on it should you 
Never, never. <laughs> this is one of the very few orchids that will rebloom off the same flower uh, stem. So uh, most of the others, once that dries up and, and goes away, uh, you can cut it off. But uh, so, uh, and I say these handle very low light. So these are perfectly fine in uh, east, uh, west, south, not direct sunlight ever. Uh, the big broad leaves like this kind of clue you in that this is native uh, in low light elevation in the tropics and so it has these flat leaves that face upwards to capture sunlight under big tropical trees. Uh, you, so, you you mentioned uh, temperatures in your home and what I see my I set mine lower than most people. Mm -hmm. uh, so what kind of temperatures are you talking about? Yeah, uh, orchids tend to be kind of categorized as cool growing, intermediate growing and warm growing. And uh, intermediate growing, uh, typically nighttime temperatures in the um, upper 50s to mid 60s and daytime temperature 10 degrees above that. And so uh, the Phalaenopsis orchid I'm holding would be perfectly happy with 60, 65, even 70 degree nights and warmer by day and would tolerate that just fine. Okay, we're go we've got about a minute and a half, so you're probably not going to be able to do your second show and tell. I just want you to give me like uh, 45 seconds on what you really like about the show that, that's at the Chicago Botanic Garden. The show this year was a dramatic change from the previous years. Uh, it, we've gone from, I'm going to say, very organic to very modern, and so mm -hmm. there's a, a wonderful use of lights and, and metal and reflection. And e even the fluorescent say, lights fluorescent lighting on the on the plants uh, and so people really should try to make it for one of the evening events and see them lit and i'll just simply say we played with strings in one room and have a phenomenal display you know what i'm talking about that uh, and so i'm really excited by that and our our horticultural staff just did a phenomenal job putting it all together as they do every year and uh, kudos to brian barker who's one of our horticulturists who's point on actually designing these shows and, and it's, it's a wonderful job. It's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day? Every, yes. Uh, and it runs through March 22nd. So head on up and, you know, talk to the folks there. You want to learn how to grow these things? You've got your questions. You're not sure if yours is going to rebloom. The experts are going to be there. And you're gonna, Absolutely. And you're going to see some wonderful stuff. Jim, I'll thank you so much. I don't know if you've ever been on the show before, but uh, it was great I having you. It's been what? a pleasure. Okay. Uh, we will... Uh, Return with Rick DeMaio. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy. Five, nine, FM. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Hey, let's just go right to the phone and bring in meteorologist Rick DeMaio. Rick, uh, you've, uh, uh, tough act to follow. We've had a couple <laughs> of PhDs on the program this morning. Just letting you know. Oh, cool. Where were they from? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I'm up here at the Grand Geneva Lodge enjoying a weekend away from Chicago. Wow. Uh, no, that's okay. That's and Yeah, happy birthday to uh, Rebecca, too. That's right. Turned the big five zero last night. I said, "You finally joined the club." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You and she said, "I don't, I don't like that club." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm looking at it in my rearview mirror, pal. So uh, I, I know, I know. I don't have a whole lot of sympathy <laughs> for it. <laughs> uh, no, we've had we had uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy from University of Delaware. And we just had uh, oh, excellent. Dr. Jim Alt from the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, so uh, yeah. it's been a really, really mm -hmm. interesting show talking about native plants, about orchids, um, about plant development yeah. and breeding. Um, really fun. You should. Did you ask him about how four inches of snow in North Georgia affects dandelions coming up out of the ground three months <laughs> early or two months early? <laughs> is that is that what happened uh, in uh, Georgia? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. There, were, there were dandelions blooming up. Oh, God. What is it about uh, two weeks ago? in parts of the Atlanta area, and uh, mm. yesterday they got three to four inches of snow. Wow. So uh, that would have been a great question to ask them. You know, it, no, it wouldn't because I can tell you right now, a dandelion will shrug it off yeah. and say, ah. They scoff. Yeah, they yeah. laugh, they laugh yeah. at that kind of snow and, mo <laughs> and move on. Uh, but, you know, it, it's funny because the other day I was looking for a forecast, and uh, I, I turned to the Weather Channel, and I forgot it's amazing how if you haven't watched it for a while, 
I forgot that there's they, like no weather anymore. N- no, I forgot that they named their storms. Yes. Winter storm. And it was like oh, you win- knew that. I did know that. Yes, but, but, but he blocked it out I of his mind. I blocked it out, and I went in, oh, and, and it was okay. like winter storm kale or whatever they were calling. No. Oh, you can't. Oh, no, it wasn't kale. It was something like that. Pomegranate. It, it was. It was. It was cod. It was cod a. It was K E D E. Yeah. Or K- it was cod. Yeah. Yeah. Ca- K- they don't name them. They don't. They don't name them after vegetables yet. But I'm sure they're going to run out of a nameless food. Yeah, they're going to run out. Yeah, because they're going to start naming spring yeah. storms, and they're going to. Oh, it's just. Oh, it's gonna be messy. Yeah. It's it's you know I just yeah. I'd forgotten yeah, I and it I just know. but oh I well know. all right I just had to bring that up. I, I know. <laughs> right. But I'm looking at your uh, forecast here. Um, you're looking. Yeah. At, we're looking at a little bit of snow. you know it's I, so interesting. We haven't no no major storms. All these events come through and no. you, you see the TV guys going. Oh, we got snow on the way, and I'm like, oh come on. Right. Right. Yeah. It's low impact event and and how many times Mike and Peg have we seen snow changing over to rain and freezing drizzle and this is I think storm number five mm-hmm. so far this year and it's one thing um, it's not like it feels like February this is like March this is what you get in March yeah where you get clipper systems go north um, the snow falls it gets wet you get a little bit of slushy stuff on the pavement. It gets cold behind it, turns to like concrete, and then it melts <laughs> three days later. Yeah. Um, so that's been the pattern. However, by the middle of the week, we got another storm coming through, which has a little bit more punch to it and a little bit more cold air. So I would not be surprised. And we've seen this in the past. Uh, the second half of February is probably going to be the snowiest and coldest uh, with that combination of the winter. And who knows if it, you know, drags into. March at this time, still nothing in the way of any significant Arctic outbreaks, uh, but from an unpleasant situation, winter is definitely going to kind of rear back and, you know, yeah. kind of fire its, you know, blast of, of Arctic air and snow at us for the uh, next couple of days, beginning Wednesday, and it looks like for the next two weeks, it looks it looks kind of like what we typically get around here uh, in February, but so far... Um, you know, you get to the middle of February, about the 15th, which we'll get to next week. And that's usually when you begin to see the signs of the Arctic air just kind of not assembling. Yeah. Um, and it's still going to be the case this year. But again, another winter where it hasn't been that cold. And again, I still wonder about how that affects, you know, wildlife and things like that. I saw a skunk the other night running around in um, Edmonton. I don't think I've seen a skunk before in February. They're, they're usually kind of hiding out. Am I right about that? Um, I have, I haven't seen them, but I have smelled them around <laughs> Highland Park as well. And I saw but, a, uh, a possum uh, right, about right. a week ago too. Yeah. Yeah. The possums I've seen, but the skunks, they usually kind of hide. And I think the skunk was like walking around going, okay, is it time to come out yet? I don't know. Um, they don't watch the weather. They just kind of like feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I meant in a way of like weather forecast. Yeah. Like you know, you anyway, know, I've seen a lot of insects is, too. Uh, I can tell you why they don't watch the weather. It's because the Weather Channel names their storms. That's why the skunks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, hey, Tropical that's storm named after my brother. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. Um, but I think what's what's interesting to point out is the moisture feed that came all the way from the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we call them these atmospheric rivers. Um, produced nearly eight to ten inches of rain across parts of Georgia and Alabama into western North Carolina. I mean, flash flood watches um, galore from that part of the country all the way up into the mid-Atlantic. Uh, and now they're getting back into another heavy rain setup again uh, this week and then probably for the next week. So they've completely flipped from the very, very dry weather that they had in the summertime when they had that extreme drought all the way into the autumn. And, and these are the things I was telling my Loyola students last week. I go, this is an example of how you go from one extreme to another. Is just the atmosphere just takes this big U and just flips everything from a ridge to a trough, and it sits there for three or four day, three or four months. And if you get enough moisture, you can get phenomenal amounts of precipitation. Um, and oftentimes, students are like, "Why are you teaching me this stuff? I, I want to know about climate change." I'm like, "Because I'm teaching you the linkage of weather to climate change. You just can't teach you the results. I have to teach you." Mm-hmm 
examples as well. And I think this is definitely one of those examples where the Southeast is now basically under flood, where six, six months ago they were under drought. And those are the questions I always love to pose. Maybe the, the PhD from Chicago Botanic Gardens and also University of Delaware. Yeah, that 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 would would be a good question. Uh, real quickly before we get to a forecast, I also hear that the Pacific Northwest has been getting hammered by uh, by oh. wet, by rain, yeah, and snow, yeah, and tremendous winter. amounts of rain, yeah, and and tremendous amounts of rain, and also yeah. their snow level has been going up and up and up. And this, again, has an impact on any glaciers that are left over Olympic National Park. Mm-hmm. So you not only warm it, but you also melt them down as well. Quick yeah. forecast, Rick. Got it. Uh, one to two inches of snow today, clearing tomorrow and Tuesday, and then more snow three to four during the day on Wednesday. Thank wow. You, Mike. Well, it, it, it'll be the most snow since uh, Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It'll be the most no since Halloween. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Talk to you next All time. right. T- w- thanks a lot, Rick. Appreciate it. I want to thank everybody on the show today, uh, Doug Tallamy and Jim Alt, of course, Rick DeMaio. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Kayla, everybody. Kayla, Hannah, and Andrew. Even Andrew. Until next time, go green or go home. Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much.